All right, the uh, Spirit and the Cross, name of the series. The work of the Holy Spirit in the process of salvation. This is lesson number seven in that series. And the title of this lesson, How God Works. It's a little presumptuous to think that in 30 minutes we're going to, <laughs> we're going to cover how God works, but maybe a better title would be how God works in a particular way here that we're going to talk about this morning. So let's review, shall we, some of the things that we've talked about so far. We keep adding, you know, I keep adding information as we, as we go. So we've said the role of the Holy Spirit is to raise up the cross of Christ to individuals, groups, and nations. We kind of summarized you know, his work. We, we, can, we can kind of peel the onion and go down and how he's done that you know, in detail. But in the big picture, what does the Holy Spirit do? And the answer to that in a, in a word, in a sentence is, he raises up the cross of Christ to individuals, groups, and nations. The cross, of course, is shorthand for the redemptive sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And of course, the benefits of that sacrifice, which is the salvation of souls. So we've taken that big long sentence or paragraph, you know, and we've, we've shrunk it down to just the word, the cross. You know, the cross means all of that. So what's the job of the spirit? He raises up the cross of Christ. Uh, to individuals and uh, groups and nations and so on and so forth. Um, we've also talked about you know, who, uh, to whom and how does the Holy Spirit direct his efforts in doing this work, in raising up the cross of Christ. And we, we broke it down into groups. We said the first group was the ancient world, the world before Christ, and how did the Holy Spirit do this? Well, the Holy Spirit sustained and guided and empowered the Jewish nation as a light to the Gentile world. As a light to the Gentile world. If someone was looking for God, they would find God through the Jewish nation. And the Holy Spirit uh, was the one who was sustaining them and guiding them and empowering them throughout history so that they could be the light unto the nations. In other words, they pointed others to the true and living God, and of course, the salvation that was to come in the, in the future. We read about, read about that in Psalm 66 in various verses we, uh, we talked about. And then the second group that he raises the cross before are the disciples and the apostles of Jesus. The Holy Spirit made them witnesses of the death and the resurrection of Jesus, as well as his ascension into heaven, not to mention, of course, his teachings and his miracles. So this eyewitness enabled the apostles to make a witness to others about the cross and its significance. And so we can say the Holy Spirit raised up the cross in front of the apostles to enable them to be the ones to raise up the cross of Christ before the world through their witness, all of which was enabled and empowered by the Holy Spirit. And then the third group was the Jewish nation. They were the first ones to whom the apostles made a witness concerning the cross of Jesus Christ. And so the Holy Spirit empowered the apostles to not only remember accurately all the teachings of Jesus, we read about that in John chapter 14, 26, but also empowered them to perform miracles which confirmed their witness. The apostles said to the Jewish nation, the Messiah has come, the Messiah you know, has, has died on the cross, the Messiah has you know, uh, brought redemption, uh, has brought the kingdom. And the people said, how do we know you're telling the truth? Well, they were speaking in other tongues and they were raising the dead and they were healing the sick and so on and so forth. And so that was the power of their witness. Well, who empowered them 
to give that witness? Well, the Holy Spirit, he was the one that was working with them uh, to enable them to raise the cross first and foremost to the Jewish nation. So before moving on in, the, in this vein here, I want to explain more fully the manner and the purpose for enabling people to do miracles. Because if we understand the why and the how God works when he enables someone to do miracles, it'll answer a lot of these questions about, you know, can we do miracles today? And how does that happen? And so on and so forth. So we're going to talk about that, how God works. Well, first of all, we need to realize that miracles are signals. They're signals. You know, you're driving along and you see a signal on the road that says curve ahead or stop or something. Well, miracles are signals. When God reveals something new, a new person, a new message, he confirms his message or his choice with miracles and signs and wonders. The miracles are always for contemporary messages. No one ever did miracles to confirm an old message or an, an existing revelation. And I'll demonstrate that in a, in a moment. This is one of the reasons why we don't believe in, in miracles. So some people say, you don't believe in miracles? Well, we do believe in miracles. Of course, there were miracles. There are miracles. God can perform miracles. But we do not believe that God empowers individuals today to do miracles, okay? There's, and so some would say, well, why? And usually we can't answer, you know, we have to go into this big long explanation. Well, the reason, the simple reason is there's no new message. We don't need miracles because there's no new message. There's no new person. You know, there's no new prophet coming that requires the signal of a miracle to point to that person. And so in, John, in Jude verse three, Jude says, uh, among other things, he says, beloved, while I was making every effort to write you about our common salvation, that was his original idea. He was going to write an epistle about their common salvation. He says, I felt the necessity, and the reason he felt the necessity is because there were you know, people in the church preaching things that were not accurate. And so he, he says, I was going to talk to you about our common salvation, you know, a, a, a letter of affirmation, a letter of encouragement. But then he says, I felt the necessity. I changed my mind. I felt the necessity to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all handed down to the saints. So he changed his mind, he says, I, instead of writing that letter, I'm writing you to appeal to you. To appeal what? What, what do you want us to do? What do you want us to understand, uh, Jude? And he says, I want you to contend earnestly, to fight for to maintain, to stand firm. I want you to contend earnestly for what? He says, for the faith. And I've said this to you before. When you say, uh, I have faith, that means, well, I have belief. I believe as true something. Or I have faith in someone. I, 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 I have confidence in someone. But in the Greek, when they put the article in there, or when the article is used, the faith, that means a body of teaching, a body of doctrine, okay? And so he says, I want you to contend earnestly for what? For the faith, the body of doctrine concerning Christ and the redemption and all of that. I want you to contend earnestly for the body of faith, a body of knowledge, which was once for all handed down to the saints. Which faith? All the faith, all the information, what happened to it? It was handed down to whom? To the saints, which saints? Well, their contemporaries, the church, the early church. All the information 
about Christ, about redemption, about holy living, about salvation, about building the church, about what's going to happen when Jesus returns. All of that faith, all of the faith has been given to the saints, first century church. What does he say? Once for all. There is no more. There is not going to be any new revelation. You have it all. And what he's saying, I appeal to you to hang on to that, to maintain that, to keep it, not to change it, not to alter it in any way. And so why are there no miracles today? Well, because we don't need signals for new revelation. We have it all right here, okay? So let me give you some other examples of these signals, just to prove my point. Moses, for example. Moses was God's servant during a time of transition from the age of the patriarchs and oral tradition to the new message of the law, the nation, the sacrificial system, the priesthood. New things came with Moses. Moses was the prophet who brought these new things these new revelations to the people. And so was there a signal involved? Well, of course, his authority to speak was confirmed by miracles. We read in Exodus chapter four, it says, then Moses said, what if they will not believe, this is when God is calling Moses to be his spokesperson. He says, uh, Moses said, well, what if they will not believe me or listen to what I say? For they may say, the Lord has not appeared to you. The Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? And he said, a staff. Then he said, throw it on the ground. So he, meaning Moses, threw it on the ground and it became a serpent. And Moses fled from it. But the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand and grasp it by its tail. So he stretched out his hand and caught it, and it became a staff in his hand. That they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. The Lord furthermore said to him, now put, out your hand, uh, put your hand into your bosom. So he put his hand into his bosom, and when he took it out, behold, his hand was, his hand was leprous like snow. Then he said, put your hand into your bosom again. So he put his hand into his bosom again and when he took it out of his bosom, behold, it was restored like the rest of his flesh. If they will not believe you or heed the witness of the first sign, signal, they may believe the witness of the last sign or signal. But if they do not, will not believe even these two signs or heed what you say, then you shall take some water from the Nile and pour it on the dry ground, and the water which you take from the Nile will become blood on the dry ground. So these miracles, you know, the snake, the staff, and his hand becoming leprous and then non-leprous, all right? And the, 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 he takes the water from the Nile and he pours it out and becomes blood. These miracles were the signal that Moses had the authority uh, 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 to speak new things and new messages from God. And so it was the Holy Spirit that empowered Moses to do these things. In the Old Testament, this empowering was referred to and described in a variety of ways. And here is where it gets a little confusing because many times in the Bible, the, the writers uh, uh, refer to the same thing in a variety of ways. And what people do mistakenly is they give each different thing a new meaning instead of realizing that all of these things mean the same thing. So I'll give you an example. In Moses' case, in Numbers 11:7, 7, it says, the Spirit is upon you. What did that mean? Well, it meant that the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, was empowering Moses to do the signs and the wonders. Why? Because he was bringing a new message, okay? A new era. 
In Numbers 27, 18, it says of Joshua, in whom is the spirit? Well, what does he mean by that? Well, it means that Joshua was going to be empowered. Empowered to do what? Well, he was going to enter into the promised land and he was going to fight battles and he was going to be the leader and he was to, uh, to have the wisdom in order to divide up the promised land among the, uh, among the tribes. And so the Holy Spirit empowered him. How do they say it? In whom is the Spirit? Why, why didn't the Spirit say, the Spirit is upon you? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, in Judges 13, 25, they talk about Samson. It says, the Spirit of the Lord began to stir him. What did that mean? It meant that the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit was empowering Samson, who was a, one of the judges of Israel, to do mighty things in the name of God, uh, to prove that God's will was being done or demanded. In 1 Samuel 10, 6, it says, the Spirit of the Lord come upon you mightily. Who is that talking about? Well, it talks about Saul, Saul the first king of Israel. What were they saying about Saul? Well, that Saul was empowered. Empowered to do what? In this case, to speak like the prophets, to prophecy, to speak the things of God, okay? Who is empowering him to do that? Because Saul was not a teacher, he was not one of those people. Uh, he was the king. But for a time, uh, he was given the power to speak like the prophets spoke. Who did that? The Holy Spirit did that. What was he doing? He was empowering Saul for a time to do particular things. And then Isaiah, Isaiah himself said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me, Isaiah 61. Again, you know, what was happening to Isaiah? The Holy Spirit was empowering him to speak from God, to bring a message to the people, and especially to bring a message to the kings, because God was speaking to the kings about their behavior, about what was to happen, uh, warning them not to make alliances with other na pagan nations and so on and so forth. And so uh, uh, Isaiah was empowered to speak uh, on behalf of God. So uh, I just picked a couple here. All of these and others to a varying degree brought forth God's messages to the people and were confirmed that they were legitimately God's spokesmen because they were all men in this case, uh, by miracles and signs and prophecy. And all of these things, the miracles, the signs, everything, they were signals that God was at work. Another example is Jesus. From the period of the law and the temple worship to the fulfillment of prophecy, the fulfillment of the law, and the shadow or preview provided by the sacrificial system practiced by the temple. Jesus was coming to fulfill all of these things. All of these things were a shadow of, the, of something that was to come in the future. And now Jesus had arrived. He was the one who was going to fulfill all of these things, all right? So Jesus announces that he has come to fulfill he has come and brought something new. So we read in John chapter 33 to 36, it says, you have sent to John and he has testified to the truth. This is Jesus speaking. But the testimony which I receive is not from man, but I say these things so that you may be saved. He was the lamp that was burning and was shining and you were willing to rejoice for a while in his light but the testimony which I have is greater than the testimony of John for the works which the Father has given me to accomplish the very works that I do testify about me that the Father has sent me. So Jesus worked by the power of the Holy Spirit. He says it right here. 
I've come to bring new things. I've come to you know, fulfill things that have been promised to you. And how do you know that what I'm saying is true? Well, if you don't believe what I say, then at least believe because of the things that I do. And what was he doing? Well, he was signaling, if you wish. How? Through the miracles, through the teachings. These were the signal that he was legitimately the person he said he was, the person that God sent. We also know that Jesus worked how? Through the power of the Holy Spirit. In Matthew 12, 28, he says, but if I cast out demons, how? By the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. So the question is, why would Jesus, the Son of God, require the power of the Holy Spirit to work miracles? Answer, because he divested himself of his omni abilities. When I say he divested himself of his, of his omni abilities, I mean his all powerful, all seeing, all knowing. You know, these are the, attribu the attributes of divinity. When it says he emptied himself and became a man, it means he emptied himself of these powers and retained only his righteousness and his holiness. So with that in mind, when you read Philippians 2, keep in mind what I've just said. So Paul says, have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who although he existed in the form of God, right? He was God, all powerful, all seeing, all knowing, you know, he was God, did not regard equality with God as a thing to be grasped. He didn't just hold on to this, but rather emptied himself. Well, when it says he emptied himself, well, that means something's got to go. He emptied himself. What exactly did he empty himself of? Well, he emptied himself of the omnipowers, all knowing, all powerful, so on and so forth. And what did he do? Taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men, being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death uh, on a cross. Imagine God, the Son, divests himself of the divine powers, retaining only his essential nature of holiness and righteousness, and took on the form of a man. And when he takes on the form of a man, he takes on the weaknesses of a man. You know, like he can't run 1,500 miles without stopping. He can't lift you know, a, a, a 500 pound rock by himself, you know, he became like a man. He had to eat, he had to go to the bathroom. He, you know, he became like a human being. So how did he do the signals? Well, we read in Matthew 3, 16, after being baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water and behold, the heavens were open and he saw the Spirit of God descending as a dove and lighting on him. In other words, the Holy Spirit descended upon Jesus at his baptism. This was similar to the Old Testament concept of you know, the Spirit coming upon someone but more dynamic because it was visual. We know that the Spirit empowered Moses, but we didn't see anything that signaled that, right? He just was able to do the things. But with Jesus, we saw it visually, the dove above his head and the voice and the word of the Father was audible in the cloud. We need to keep in mind that Jesus he was a Jew 
and, and he spoke primarily to Jews. And so the symbols and the concepts were Jewish uh, in nature. So when the Holy Spirit came upon Jesus, the Jews knew what this meant in a Jewish context. In other words, a prophet was now empowered by God. A new message was coming. A signal, there was a signal that was given. They understood that idea. When a signal was given, a new message, a new person, a new era, something new was about to happen. Something new was about to be revealed. And so with Jesus, the Jews saw for themselves that he was empowered by the Holy Spirit and that something new was coming. In his case, the fulfillment of the promises of the Old Testament. So there's an example of the signals, okay, in the life of Jesus. I've shown you the signals in the life of Moses and how that worked. I've shown you the signals in the life of Jesus and how remarkably that worked. Let's look at the apostles. From the period of the fulfillment of the law and the prophets and the sacrificial system by Jesus' cross to the good news of salvation and entry into the kingdom of God for everyone announced by the gospel uh, message. So we read in Luke uh, chapter one, verse 77, it says to give his people the knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of sins. So who was going to give that knowledge to his people? Well, the apostles were going to do that. A new message is going to come, right? So the apostles had a new message, not that the kingdom is near and that all must prepare for the kingdom. That, that was John the Baptist's message, but rather the kingdom is here and now everyone must enter into the kingdom. That's the new message. Now, miracles were done in order to confirm this new message. The Holy Spirit empowered the apostles to do these things. Like Jesus, their empowering was also dynamic in the sense that it was seen and heard. You see the difference? With Moses, he, he was empowered and what you saw were the signals, but there was no visual representation that Moses received power, okay? But, but for Jesus, you, you saw it, the dove, the voice, okay? And for the apostles also, their empowerment was visual. You saw it, there were the tongues of fire, there was the mighty rushing wind, all right, to, 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 not only, to signal that they had been uh, empowered and were about to do things. All right, so let's talk about uh, the baptism with the Holy Spirit. Though so we've talked about this phenomenon last time, and I'd like to add some detail uh, to this term. This expression is first used by John the Baptist, Matthew 3 and Mark 1, Luke 3. In every instance, John uses it in referring to Jesus who would administer this baptism and John's general audience would be the recipients. Now the key question is, what did John the Baptist's audience understand by the term baptize you with the Holy Spirit? Never mind what our evangelical or charismatic friends, what they believe it means. Let's, let's you know, take a look and see what did the Jews of the first century, what did they think this meant when John said this to them? The key question, like I say, is what did John's audience understand by this term? In other words, what did they think would happen to them if they received this particular baptism? I can tell you 
that they did not equate this term with their ability to speak in tongues or perform healings or do other types of supernatural acts. If you ask the Jew in the first century who had just heard one of John the Baptist's sermons where he talked about, you know, but one day you'll be baptized you know, with the Holy Spirit. And you asked him, what do you think this means? Does this mean you'll be speaking in tongues? Or <laughs> he would not have thought that. That would not have been his, his answer. John the Baptist used this expression to describe the concept familiar to the Jews of that era. The baptism or the immersion or the outpouring of the Holy Spirit was a theological, actually it was an eschatological uh, term. When we say eschatological, we mean dealing with the end times, the end of the world, the end of the age. So it was a term referring to the end of the age, okay? So the baptism or the outpouring of the Holy Spirit was an eschatological term or concept dating back to the Babylonian captivity where the Jews were carried off into exile for 70 years. So John's audience understood this term to mean a spiritual time or excuse me, a special time or it meant a period of salvation, or it meant the great activity of God in and for and around his chosen people. So if you ask them, what, what, what is John talking about? That uh, you know, when the Messiah comes, uh, you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Their answer would be, God is going to work among us in, great, in a great way, all right? So we read, for example, in Haggai, chapter two, verse five, as for the, he's an Old Testament prophet, minor prophet, as for the promise which I made you when you came out of Egypt, my spirit is abiding in your midst. Do not fear. Uh, baptism with the Holy Spirit, just saying it in a, in a different way. Here the prophet is referring to the mosaic era of the past as a time when the spirit was among the people and the nation was saved. In Isaiah 44, verses one to three, he says, but now listen, O Jacob, my servant, and Israel, whom I have chosen. Thus says the Lord who made you and formed you from the womb, who will help you. Do not fear, O Jacob, my servant, and Jehuron, whom I have chosen for I will pour out water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour out my spirit on your offspring and my blessing on your uh, descendants. So here the Lord is reassuring the people through the prophet Isaiah that the family of Jacob, another way of saying the Jewish people, will experience God's providential care don't worry, he says to them, I will take care of you. The expression spoken by Isaiah was not understood by the people to mean that they themselves would be enabled to speak in tongues and do miracles or heal people or cast out evil spirits. They didn't understand that to, to mean that. This is the meaning that our charismatic and Pentecostal friends have given this you know, term in the last hundred years or so. But the Jews to whom it was spoken originally, both in the Old and New Testament, never interpreted this expression in this way. When it was said to them in various ways, they merely thought God will be with us. God will help us. That's what it meant for them. Jesus uses the expression only one time in speaking to his apostles. And that's in Acts chapter one, verses four to eight. It says, Luke writes, gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem. This is Jesus, uh, but to wait for what the father had promised, which he said, you heard from me for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit 
not many days from now. That's the only time Jesus is recorded in having used this phrase. And who does he say it to? You know, a crowd of 5,000 people? No, he says it to his apostles. And in the next verses, it explains, you know, the Bible explains itself. It says, so when they had come together, they were asking him saying, Lord, is it at this time that you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the epochs which the father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. Do you see all the stuff that I've been saying the last half hour come together in this one verse? Who? The Holy Spirit. What is he going to do? He's going to come upon you. What's going to happen? You're going to be empowered. Really, what are we going to do? You're going to be empowered to do what? to give signals, to signal to the people that a new time has come, that a new message is about to be spoken. The problem is in verse four and five when the Lord tells the apostles that they will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Note that they didn't understand that to mean that they would have miraculous powers. Even they didn't get it when he told them that. Jesus is describing the entire experience of the new age dawning at Pentecost, signaled, remember, that those bringing a new revelation or message were given powers to carry out their ministry. So this new age, this new message, what's the new message? Salvation through Christ is now available. The Messiah has come, he's done his work, his death, burial, and resurrection, that's, that's all new. All of this new stuff is signaled or witnessed by the signs and the miracles that'll be performed by the apostles. And the very first one will be speaking in tongues, speaking in languages that they had never studied or learned. Now, the apostles, however, understood the expression as it had always been used up to and including John the Baptist. You know, that the end was near, that God would be working among his people, that all of this would be visible to the world as God would once again restore the exalted Jewish nation. So in verse six, I go back and we read it again. It says, so when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time you're restoring the kingdom to Israel? They thought that Jesus had come back to be the leader like Moses in restoring Israel to glory. Note what they say, will you at this time restore Israel? Is now the time we're taking over? The good times are here and we're going to throw off Roman, you know, uh, you know, the yoke of Roman slavery and, and Israel will rise up again and it'll be the golden period. Is this the time? Imagine he's been with them for three years teaching them. He's died, he's resurrected. They've witnessed his resurrection <laughs> and still they don't get it. Still, they still have the old idea. So here in verse 7a, Jesus uses another Old Testament term. He says, the spirit will come upon you. Remember, I read you a whole bunch of the spirit is in me, the spirit is on me, the spirit is poured forth, the spirit is stirring. He uses one of these. He says, the spirit will come upon you to clarify for them and us what is about to happen. So as Jews, the apostles clearly understood this to mean what, had, what it had always meant in the past. The empowering of an individual to enable them to serve God and or to proclaim a message, a new message. However, and I will finish on time, in verse eight, Jesus says and clarifies, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses and so on and so forth. In other words, 
you're going to proclaim a new message to the world and the Holy Spirit is going to empower you to proclaim that message. So this power will confirm that this witness is true and of course that Jesus is Lord in Christ. This then is how the Holy Spirit raised the cross of Christ before the Jewish nation. How did he do it? He empowered the apostles who were Jews to preach the new message of salvation first to the Jewish nation. They raised up the cross of Christ to the Jewish nation through their empowered witness. Empowered how? Through the Holy Spirit. Okay, so let's summarize. Every time God sent a new message, he would empower the messenger to confirm his witness. This is why we don't accept those who claim to have miraculous powers today. The reason is they don't have a true revelation or a new message for, from God. Why do we know that? Because Jude says we've received everything once for all. We have it here. Nobody's going to add a new chapter. Nobody's going to say, oh, you know, I, I hear this all the time. A lady said, oh, I, I received the new message from God yesterday. No, you didn't. You, you didn't receive, you may have thought something, but did, God didn't give you a new message. So God does not use miracles to confirm old messages, all right? So let's look at the several expressions concerning the Holy Spirit in context to understand what they mean, how they are different from each other and what they don't mean. Quickly, baptism of the Holy Spirit. This expression does not appear in the Bible. I told you that last time. The idea of it is inferred. For example, in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, for by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. The inference here is a baptism administered by the Holy Spirit. Well, what baptism do you think that is? Well, it's water baptism. Water baptism is the Holy Spirit's baptism. He commands it in his word, the Bible. In Ephesians chapter four, verse five, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. In Acts 2.38, I won't read it, we've read it so many times. Repent and be baptized, right? The apostles inspired by the Holy Spirit command that all repentant believers receive water baptism. To this day, until Jesus comes, that will be the only baptism that exists the only baptism that preachers preach. And I don't need to do a miracle to prove that that is God's will. It's in here. Everybody can confirm it. All right, baptism with the Holy Spirit. This is an expression used by John the Baptist in his preaching to the Jews who understood it to mean a period of salvation or a time when God would work dynamically among his people. These same concepts were expressed in the Old Testament with different phrases like, I will pour forth my spirit, uh, Haggai uh, 2 uh, verse 5, Isaiah 44, 1 to 3, we don't have time to read it, but that's what they uh, talk about, that's what he talks about. In Joel 2.29, even on the male and female servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And then of course in Acts 2.17, and it'll be in the last day God says that I will pour forth my spirit on all mankind. Now, this was an expression used by Jesus to describe the entire experience of the new age, dawning at Pentecost. It signaled the miraculous signs done through the apostles, and we read that in Acts chapter one, verse five. Note that John the Baptist, here's an important thing. Note that John the Baptist 
didn't do miracles. Do you ever wonder why? Why did John the Baptist do no miracles? But the apostles did miracles. The difference was that John was not revealing or proclaiming a new message. The Jews were to be ready for the Messiah all through their history. John simply confirmed this. No signal was needed. He was just saying, hey, you know the thing we've been waiting for? You know, it's coming near, so let's be ready. Well, that, that was an old message. No, no signal was required for that. The apostles, on the other hand, had a revelation. They had a new message. Jesus, the Son of God, made man, died and resurrected. Repent, be baptized, enter into the kingdom, which is the church. Their speaking in tongues confirmed, signaled that they were offering a new message. And then of course, the spirit will come upon you. An Old Testament expression meaning the empowering of an individual for a special task, to lead in war, to prophesy, uh, conceiving the body of Jesus miraculously. You know, in Luke 1.35, the angel answered and said to Mary, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. It was an expression used by Jesus to describe the empowering that the apostles would receive in order to confirm their witness. Jesus is written from the dead, risen from the dead, and their new message that Jesus is the Messiah, believe and express that faith in repentance and baptism. The spirit coming upon them was the same as the Old Testament, but in a greater dimension and with more visible signs. Okay, so there's hopefully an explanation of how God works with signals and why some did miracles and others didn't do miracles. And hopefully you understand why today no one do, does miracles, why? Because God can't do it anymore or God couldn't empower us? No, of course not. No new miracles because there's no new message. We have the same message we've had for 2000 years. All right, next week is our last lesson. Uh, conclusion, summary, and next week, what about Cornelius? Oh dear, there's always this, uh, you know, people say, yeah, what about Cornelius? You know, he spoke in tongues. So we'll talk about Cornelius next week and we'll wrap it up. All right, thank you for your kind attention. We are dismissed.